centurion came to him, pleading with him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And what I'm assuming is this man had a great fall or something along these lines. He's totally paralyzed and he's being tormented from the crown of his head. His, his whole being is now tormented because of a paralysis. Something in a cataclysmic event has taken place in this man's life. And here you've got the centurion coming after Jesus, who he knows to be the healer. And he says, my servant lies at home. He's paralyzed. He's tormented. And Lord, I need you to... And, 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 and this is as far as you went when you said, Lord, this is what I'm telling you what I got going on. And Jesus said, well, I'll come and I'll lay my hands on him. And the man said, no, Lord, you ain't got to do that because I understand government. I understand kingdom power. I understand the authority. He came to Jesus just asking for a word. All he wanted Jesus was to do was, Lord, I'm, I'm bringing you my petition. I'm bringing you the calamity. I'm bringing to you my pain. And Lord, I know is what he's saying. I know. Somebody say, I know. I know there is a word in God that when released will set me free. I know that there is a word in God that when released will set me free. And here's what he says. Jesus says, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answers and says, Lord, I'm not worried that you should come under my roof, but only release, notice, speak a word. Whatever word you have concerning my situation, whatever the word of God has, Lord, all you need to do, because I, listen, Let's think, think about the faith of this man. All you have to do, Jesus, is just release a word, and I know that my servant shall be liberated. Because the power of what's going to come out of you will totally drive the damage out of this man's body, loose him and liberate. I know, Lord, the word that you've got is dynamic and powerful. Lord, I know you got a word. Just release that word, and I know my servant shall be healed. Somebody say amen. amen. Think about the faith this man has in the governmental authority of Jesus Christ. Because he says, for I am a man who's under authority. I have soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another one, come, and he comes. And, and, and do this, and he does it. It doesn't matter. I understand authority. I understand that when I, in my position of authority, when I make a command, it's done. And I understand in your position of authority, in the entire realm, the entire spirit kingdom, your government, all you have to say is go, come, stay, leave. All you have to do, Lord, is release the word. You have a word of tremendous governmental power that when you release that word, my servant shall be healed from a man under authority. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And he said to you, and, and I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in the darkness. They'll be weeping and, wa they'll be weeping and gnashing their teeth. And Jesus said to the servant, or to the centurion, go your way as you have believed. As you have believed. Okay? Kingdom seeker is faith receiver. One who can speak forth. As you have believed and declared, so let it be done to you in the manner of your faith. As you came after the kingdom, discerning the authority of the kingdom, and the authority of the king in the supernatural and the spiritual realm, that whatever Jesus said, heaven is going to back. There are the armies of God operate with him, and this thing will be driven from his servant. And he knew for, think about it. Jesus is amazed with the level of faith. So what we want to do is we want to get to the same place. We want to get to the same place of faith in our lives. We want to know how to address everything that stands in the way. So go back into Matthew's gospel and go back to chapter 6, and let's look at verse 25. Everything deals with a lot of need in our life, physical need, financial need, whatever the need is. There's always a stress and anxiety and a worry about daily kingdom problems or just daily issues in life. And this is the biggest thing which keeps us occupied and focused and distracted. Somebody, somebody say distracted. These things keep us distracted. Life can keep us distracted. Life can control everything spiritual about us. Life can control our confession. Life that have tremendous power. Or we can make a decision that God's kingdom has the power and we want to get ourselves connected to the kingdom of God. Listen, Jesus is telling us something and he's not lying. This wasn't just for the few in the New Testament. This is for you and I. This is a kingdom, somebody say kingdom. This is a kingdom principle. 
But we have to address the issue, which is what he does. This man got to a place where he didn't let worry, fear, or doubt control him. He had total confidence in the word that Jesus had. So what did he search for? The word that Jesus had. Lord, you have a word. All you got to do is release that word. All I need is the word from God. Think about this. All we need is the word from God to be imparted so deep into our spirit that we know that we know that when we release that word, the thing that we desire is being done. Somebody say amen. It's getting ourselves to the place. This isn't a logic thing. This is a spiritual thing. This is a supernatural thing connected to the divine relationship you have with the Holy Spirit. Getting to that place where you know God, I know you got a word on this, hallelujah. You release that word into me, you show me that word in here, and I thank you, Father, I'm going to let that word in, that word's going to produce after its own kind, and I'm going to declare on that word, that word is going to loose this situation, and I'm going to be whole because I'm trusting you it's going to be done, and I will not step back till the whole thing is full, it has been fulfilled according to your word, and I will give you the praise in advance for it. Now, it says, therefore I say to you, verse 25, do not worry about your life. This is to be burdened down with the distractions of the daily grind of what goes on in your world. Do not be worried about your life. This is to be burdened down, weighed down with the distractions that are attempting to take place in your life. Remember, everything tries to distract you from faith. You can either address it all with faith or or it can distract you from your faith and take dominion and then you become burdened down. It, It doesn't matter what it is. Everything, and I'm I'm talking to to you as the body of Christ. Everything that goes on in your day can do one of two things. It can become a platform for your continuation of the addressing of the word of God or be something to actually pull you away from the word of God. The devil's always looking to make everything in your life to be noise like bugs all around your head you got everything else going on and you have no confession because you're chasing this and you're chasing this and you're chasing this and you're worried about that and you're anxious about that. This is, think about it. Am I not correct? Everything around us could become such a, it'll become such a bummer and a downer to our life. We have no concept how we're going to win. How can God win when I'm so wrapped, when I'm so wrapped up in all of the cares and all the worries, I've not given one of them to Jesus because I don't trust my own faith walk. Because I don't trust my relationship. Because I'm not close enough with God to allow God to be in con- for God to be in control. I'd rather be offended at God for not fixing my problem than address the fact that I need to become a confessor of a stronger relationship that I need to walk in. Notice what he says. Do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about your body, what you're going to put on it. For, for is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bonds. Let your heavenly Father feed them. Think about this. Now, when Jesus gave us this principle, he said, remember, now he's talking to the, he's talking to kingdom-hungry people here. Talking to those that really want to press it with God. Because he's pushing them towards something. Because everybody every day worries about their, some people are bigger worry. Some people have the anointing to worry. Okay? <laughs> They have the calling to worry. That's my calling to worry. What do I need to worry about? Tell me so I can worry about it for you. I will take your worry upon me, and I shall worry for you. Okay? <laughs> that would be, that's good. They have anointing to worry. I have a worry anointing on me. Really, yeah, I worry about everything. I mean, so you don't have to. Tell me what it is. I'll worry you go on your life. Somebody has to take the weight of the world on their shoulders. And the thing is, and because of this, we get totally distracted. And he says, now, I want you to look. Jesus said this. Look at what's going on. I've got it all provided, all set up out of eternity. I set nature into a position of an ongoing flow that always provides for the beasts of the field, for the birds of the air. He says, I have, I have already set everything in motion that they know where to find it. And I mean, even though there's droughts and things, I understand. But, but, but what he's telling them is they're not worrying. They just get up and they wake up in the morning. You all know, 5 o'clock, birds start screaming. And they go zipping down and bugs are gone, worms are gone. Everything just seems to pop out of the ground. Why? I don't know. Because God's going, time to feed the birds. I don't know. But he's got everything set in motion that they don't worry. They just do because they're fully expecting Because that's how God used this. So Jesus said, look at this. And are not you more valuable than they? Our faith has to be connected to our value. 
I believe I have value with God. You have to tell us yourself, I believe. I have value. I have value. I have value. I have value with God. More value than creation. I have value. All these things are to show me that I have value. Hallelujah. I need to know I have value because Jesus said you have value. Not an arrogant thing, it's a God thing. And yet you and I have the nature of God. We're created in the image and likeness of God. Not only the natural things that God has, but actually to pursue God and all the things that God delights to do. The birds don't have that. You and I do. So we said, don't worry about your clothing or consider even the lilies of the field, how they grow, they don't toil, they don't spin, they, they just sow and everything is just burst up and up they come. The beauty of things is because God has set some powerful laws into motion. And the goal is to get the... The goal is to get the supernatural laws of God in motion in your life. Romans chapter 8 says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the standard and the law of how the life of God operates through Jesus Christ. Always for your redemption. Always for your deliverance. Always for your healing. Always for your breakthrough. Always for his kingdom purpose. The law, the spirit of, of the life of God, the reconciliated life of God, all that's in Christ, the law of the spirit is always designed to liberate you, set you free, elevate you into a kingdom position and know who you are in Christ. That is a standard. So we want to get that principle going on the inside of us. So, so just like the centurion, we automatically know the authority we have, the authority Jesus has. So, hey, just, just release the word, I know what's done. And this man doesn't even have what you and I got. He had the infilling baptism of the Holy Ghost. He had full understanding of the government of, uh, of just how Jesus operated. And he knew for a fact, all Jesus had to do is just release the word, bam, and his servant was healed. Now here Jesus tells us, that not even Solomon in all of his glory was not, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like these because it was a natural thing. He goes on, therefore, verse 31, do not worry, again, be weighed down with dissipation, Concern and fear and agitation, keep adding the words to that, of how you're going to operate in things because that's not a kingdom principle. And Jesus is about to release the principle of the kingdom that, that you and I need to operate in. He says, for, for after all these things the world seeks, but your heavenly Father, are you ready? Knows that you need all these things. He knows it. Your heavenly Father already knows that you need these things. What, what we are called to do is get connected with the law of the Spirit of God that the needs that we have can be met by faith in Jesus Christ. God knows, think about this, and I was thinking this the other day, God knows what I need. And since God knows what I need, I can ask anything according to his will because he knows I need it. First John, if I ask anything according to his will, First John chapter 5, I know that he hears me. And I know then that if he hears me, I know, somebody say, I know, that I have the petition of the desire of my heart. As long as I come to the place, I'm not begging and pleading. And to think, remember, that's not, that's not faith. That's trying to hopefully get in on the good side of God and try to force God to do something when, when the real issue we're about to find out is how to receive by getting connected to the principle of his kingdom so we can walk in the break that he says, for after all these things that the world seeks, and they're going to keep seeking it because they're not connected to the kingdom, they're connected to this kingdom order here. He said, but your heavenly Father knows what you need. Therefore, seek first the government, the kingdom, the splendor, the might, the dimensions. No, it's kingdom. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God is in your midst. And as he preached about the kingdom, he constantly demonstrated. Storms were stilled. Bread was multiplied. He walked on water. Death was overthrown. Disease was overthrown. Paralysis overthrown. Demons were driven out. Jesus did. He demonstrated the power of the kingdom, of a greater kingdom than the natural realm, a supernatural kingdom that could order the natural and perform miracles in the natural realm because of kingdom principle. So he says, you first of all, you need, to, you need to pursue kingdom purpose, the government of God. That's why in the prayer of the Our Father, which is earlier on in Matthew, he says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. 
Now, we can understand Jesus was looking for the last time and your kingdom show up on earth, and we got that in the book of Revelation. But he's also telling them to presently pray something because their lives are only 70 or 80 years and then that generation is done. So generation upon generation, life upon life, is being asked to stand in the covenant. Lord, your government. Lord, your purpose. Lord, your kingdom. Everything about your, your laws and your rules of kingdom principle. Faith and healing and deliverance and provision. Everything that's always flowing kingdom come your kingdom and then be done your will in the matter. See, the success of the church is Jesus said what? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you how? Always. That means he and his kingdom will be constantly flowing. But see, we, we're the ones that shut that off. we got to cut that off because we start worrying again. It's this, it's this flow toward us, and we tend to stop it. Listen, that flow can only come because you open up. Okay, by faith, I have to allow the kingdom of God to move in my life. By faith, I have to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. By faith, i got to receive healing. i got to let that kingdom in me so the kingdom can transform me. So he's telling us we got to draw from that kingdom because that kingdom's always present to bring the breakthrough, but we got we to we acknowledge it's there. Therefore, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. And notice what he says in the second part. What's the second part? And its righteousness, or and his righteousness. What does that tell me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go deep with us a little bit. Not too deep, kind of like a little deeper than just the wave pool, maybe the third step down. A little bit of the wave. We have to make a decision that we discern between two things. We understand the government and the kingdom of God that flows. Somebody say flows. flows. Kingdom of God that's present, always flowing. And two, how to be in the right position on the inside for that kingdom to be imparted into my life. I can know all about the flow of God. I can know all about salvation. I can know it all, but never enter into it. I can know about God's healing or, or about God's deliverance, but never by faith enter into it. I never bring myself to a position where I want to walk in the right standing of God so I can be right in where the rain is. Somebody, somebody say where the rain is. I want to be where the rain of God is. Believers, it's not just kind of popping in and touching it. It's getting, the Bible says, and to know the kingdom and what? His righteousness. I need to understand that completeness of the word. Okay, go to Romans chapter 5. and Let's just, let's just jump there for a minute. Because when I got the righteousness of God in me, and I pursued to be in, somebody say pursue. I want to be in right standing with Jesus. I understand the power of his blood. And I need that applied to my life. This isn't about legalisms. This is getting my whole self consecrated under the mighty hand of God. I want to be in the place where the righteousness of God is declared in my life. I want to be in the place where the victory of God. I want to be in his right standing. Because in his right standing, notice what it says. Chapter 5, verse, verse 1. Therefore, and this is connected to right standing, having been justified by my faith, that means he quitted from all guilt. I have peace with God. That's a governmental peace, connection between God and I. I have peace through God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom I also now have access by this faith into the very what? The Bible says grace. The grace. The grace is the revealing and operation of everything connected to the kingdom of God. I want access by faith. Notice, by faith, I have access into the grace of God. Therefore, I can stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 17, chapter 5. For, if I, for by one man's offense, death might have reigned through the one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will do what? Reign where? In this life. Through the one, Jesus Christ. We are called to reign in this position. When we get connected to the right standing of God, that's why Jesus said, seek the kingdom and to be in right standing with God. Paul says in Philippians, I don't want my own righteousness. I want to get rid of it all so I can know the righteousness of God because that's the righteousness that is blessed because connected to the righteousness of God is where the flow of grace comes in. Somebody say flow. We got to get ourselves under where the, listen, the flow is always there. The flow of grace, the provision of God is always there. 
But there's the ability to step in under that flow and allow that flow. And that is because I'm pursuing, I want to know his righteousness. I want to be dead to self and alive to God. I want everything to be kingdom oriented. I want his government, his provision, his grace. I want everything. So I want to get into that place where there is nothing in the way in my life which is going to hinder me from standing in the place of the grace of God and to allow the righteousness of God so I can see the provision of God take place in my life. Somebody say hallelujah. Okay, Philippians chapter 4. You all still with me? Okay. Philippians chapter 4 tells me then how to receive. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm, what I'm thinking here. You know, we can, and I just, just be real. If we, if we teach all this stuff, I teach it, preach it, minister it, because I want to be at the sharpest edge of the word of God. But I want to cut through our doubt and disbelief so we can actually receive it and start walking on it and act on it. Reading the word, we met a lot of people that know, I mean, that pride themselves on knowing their Bible from Genesis to Revelation and back around to Genesis again. But if you looked at their life and their attitude and lifestyle, they haven't applied everything that they're so smug about what they know. We want to get ourselves to the place where not just reading the word and hearing it, Lord, I want to get along with God because I want to get it. I want it. I want it to cut through. Isn't that what Hebrews 4 says? The word of God is sharper than any, any two-edged sword. Get that word, divide between soul and spirit. Cut away the natural realm. Cut away the natural realm. Cut away the soulless realm. And let the Holy Ghost of God begin to really move into my being. So the word of God can transform it. That is for the hungry. That's for the few that are willing to press it until they get it because they really want the end result of the kingdom of God. Many, you got, the bottom is full, folks. The bottom of the pool is full. A lot of people down there just content, drowning, but all can, that pool was not, maybe not quite the best rendition, okay? A lot of people at the bottom of the pool, but the few at the top, these are the ones that have the victory. Sitting on the bottom doesn't do you any good. Striving across the top is where you want to be. Philippians chapter 4. We want to decide, do I, am I willing to transform my thinking? Somebody, somebody say my thinking. Can I transform my thinking? People say, you know, you can't, teach, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah, maybe not. But a believer can be transformed on a consistent basis by the renewing of their mind. A believer can be transformed all the way to the day by the renewing of their mind. And every day be a brand new day in Christ. Every day is a day to learn from God. Every day to stop and say, I don't care what you've been doing the last five years. That's how you've been acting. That is changeable. That's not pride. That's finally wanting to change. People say, you need to change. Okay, and that's a price. Philippians chapter 4 says, verse 5, let be anxious for nothing, which of course connects us with what we just had in Matthew chapter 6. Be anxious for nothing. Now, you got to read this in context with, with, with all of chapter 3, where he says, I'm pressing toward the mark, the high call of God in Christ Jesus. That I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to obtain to the resurrection. I want to be one that gets gloriously raptured into the presence of God. I want to discern the fullness of what the resurrection is going to be like. I don't want to kind of go to heaven. Maybe some people say, well, you know, it's just resurrection power. I think it's the whole resurrection. I, don't want to, I want to obtain to the ultimate of that glorious resurrected moment that, we, that we've been roaring into heaven, are hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Not, okay, you're okay, come on in. You did all right, you can come in too. Saved, but by grace. Fire of God on you, not much left, but come on in. Okay? I mean, there's a lot that are, that's how they're going into glory. They're going to look like just charcoals, but you're okay. The Bible says, yet saved by fire. They will be saved, but by fire. Not much left, not much in, but hey, you're in. Oh, made it. Except, how about gloriously, triumphantly roaring into heaven because you were a good, well done, faithful servant who pursued the kingdom of God and fought your faith fight. A lot of people are going to go to heaven like this. Screaming on their deathbed, I'm not ready! <laughs> is it not true? I'm telling you, according to the Bible, it is. I want to reign with Christ. I want to just stumble around the streets of God. 
I want to reign. I mean, if I could be a gutter cleaner, that's fine. At least I'll be in eternity. But I'd rather reign with Christ. Street sweeper in glory. I'm okay. I'm okay, okay. <laughs> but you're there. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart, keep you focused, keep you directed, your heart and your mind, so your thoughts, your heart, your passions, your emotions are held in check through Jesus Christ, the peace of God, because when you're going to begin to pursue God, the Bible says don't be worried down, weighed down with dissipation, fears and concerns, because you're not connected right, but rather when you approach God is with the attitude as you know all my needs, and I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that need is going to be met. It's already being done. I'm going to walk on knowing God's got it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Standing in the peace of God that will keep me from ever stepping over to the place of worry. That's not presumption. That's walking this thing out by faith. You've got to have that word to know, Father, this is what I want. This is where I want to walk. I go to, I go to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to save a couple more here, and then we're going to close it down for tonight. Colossians chapter 2. If I would be, the Bible says be anxious for nothing. That's not a suggestion. Be anxious for nothing. But I need to replace something with something else. You need to replace your worry and your fear with the kingdom and the righteousness of God. You need to get the worry and the fear out and replace it with something else. Just getting something out is not good enough, believer. I don't want to just get a disease out. I want the healing power of God coming in my body. Jesus said if the, just, just the vessel being swept clean is great, but if it's not saturated with the things of heaven... Then darkness is coming back seven times worse. So we want to exchange. We want to get the worry out by bring this. And Paul didn't say, Paul said, not that I want to be unclothed with my old flesh, but what I really want is I really want to be clothed with the new nature. So it means the old thing goes and the new thing comes. So I got to recognize it, not just, oh, I shouldn't worry, I shouldn't worry, I shouldn't worry. And I'm worrying about worrying because I'm not supposed to be worrying. And now I'm worrying. Worrying about worrying. Because I'm not supposed to worry. Now I'm worried. <laughs> that is, I bet that's so real. When he says, you got to chase something else. Squirrel. You've got to chase kingdom. We've got to replace the one with the other. Colossians chapter 2. Getting down to this. If I'm going to win this, Jesus said don't worry by doing what? Chase the kingdom and its righteousness. Make a conscious decision. You can't change all your circumstances. God needs to. That's why Jesus said back in Matthew, sufficient for today are the things to concern yourself with because, because you're going to worry about tomorrow. And the fear is the same word. Worry weighed down with dissipation, with concern, with anxieties, and with stresses. God says, don't worry or be anxious about tomorrow. Deal with today. Trust him today. And if you can deal with tomorrow, speak life over your tomorrow before you even get there. Don't let tomorrow control your today. That's, yeah, but you don't understand what I got to do. That's your problem. You're so worried now with what you think you got to do or what isn't happening that you're destroying your today and you cannot walk in victory today because you've got tomorrow all worried over. That's what he said. We let ourselves get controlled by our worry. Again, it's an anointing for some people. We want to make this decision. I know tomorrow's got some issues. But I'm going to walk in faith right here and right now because my God is a what? He's a now God. He's got my tomorrow. 
Hallelujah. I know I got needs to be dealt with tomorrow, but hallelujah, right now, I know my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And I defeat that spirit of worry. You are defeated because I got the kingdom of God. And I'm going to walk in right stand with God. Therefore, I know that whatever I need by God is going to supply it. I receive it being done now. Hallelujah. I'm going to get a good night's stinking sleep because I will not worry. When I get up in the morning, God has got it. Why? Because I gave it to him today. That'll preach. Actually, it just did. Can we do that, though? Can we confront our worry side in our nature? So like this centurion, Lord, you got the word. Jesus was blown away. Look at the faith of this guy. He didn't worry about nothing. You just released the word. I know your authority, and it is done, done, done. You ain't even got to come under my house. You just say it. It's done. Thank you, Lord. Jesus said it. He went home. According to his faith, the centurion was healthy. Now, when... I mean, the centurion's service. What did he say? Get back to work. I prayed for your healing. Now get back to work. <laughs> Celebrate your victory by cleaning that room. <laughs> we had a lady in here that, that, that uh, what's her name? She was, uh, she, um, she's not here tonight, but some years back, this woman had, she, had, she hadn't been able to drive a car for like three years because of back surgeries and all kinds. I mean, she was a mess. I mean, she could, you know, she could do nothing. And she's pretty much, you know, have, you know to be on that, where well, you got to get all the you know, federal funds because that's where you're at because you can't work, you can't do anything. She came in from a prayer meeting, came in the prayer meeting. It was, we must have had it like on Saturday night. Came in the Sunday, was it Sunday morning? She came down front, you remember, because she saw the fire of God hit her when we reached to pray for her. Fire of God hit her. She ran around the church. Okay, the next day, she pulled the muscle. Why? Because she climbed up on a chair to clean her cabinet, something she had not done in three years. Notice it says, verse 14, Colossians, no break down. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against you, why could I be a kingdom seeker and a faith receiver? Because everything that was against me spiritually, every demonic thing, every sin, every issue, everything has been defeated. Having wiped out with his blood that whole chart that had everything that the, that, that the law and hell had against you, literally wiped it clean, nothing. Everything that was contrary to us, everything that was against us, facing us, and accusing us. The accuser of the brethren has been defeated in your life. Doesn't matter where you think you're at. He's been defeated. Doesn't matter what you think you're going through or if you think you failed. He's been defeated. And you have the right to get up and walk in that every single day. And he took it out of the way and he nailed it to the cross having disarmed. Notice what he says. Disarmed principalities. Disarmed all the powers. He made a public spectacle of everything of fear and doubt and the, peace, the attitudes of failure and hurts and offenses and brokenness. He defeated every one of those spirits. And he wiped away all their authority from your life. So you can walk, according to Ephesians chapter 2, having been raised up with Christ, seated in the heavenly places, that's what God thinks about you. That's how God sees you. Give the Lord a shout in the house, would you? Stand your feet, guys. Did you join me up here on the platform? We're going we're to minister a couple of songs here.